Okay, welcome everyone to our workshop tonight entitled Regaining Your Youth and Vitality. I'm Dr. Michael Taggart with the Kirkland Health Institute and also Lake Washington Chiropractic. And before we begin, I want to ask you some very important questions. By a show of hands, how many of you would like to have a body full of energy? Yes. And keep your hands up there if you would like to have a more youthful and active body. Do you want that too? Okay, good. Now, also, would you be interested in having the confidence that as you age, that you wouldn't have to develop disease and advancing arthritis like unfortunately many people in our society do? If that sounds good, you keep your hands up there. Good, okay, good. Now, if I could share that information with you that would help give you that information so you could reach that goal, would you all be willing to give me your full attention here tonight? Okay, great. So, the information that I'll be sharing with you tonight is, um, it's actually helped me personally, and it's also helped hundreds and hundreds of patients that I've had the pleasure of helping over the last 20 years. I've been in practice for, it'll be 21 years in, in July. And so the information that I'll be sharing with you is not, is not just my opinion. A lot of the slides that I'll be, be showing you are talk about what the experts are saying about how to get optimal health as far as health and well-being and how to get more energy in your body. And we're also going to talk about what, are, are what the experts are saying about the state-of-the-art rehab system that we've implemented tonight. And, and the reason that we do this is that I'm very passionate about helping people and when we have health problems it really gets in the way of us being the best that we can be. We all want to be our best but we have these health challenges. It really robs us of energy, robs us of our vitality. We can't be the people that we were intended to be. And I'm definitely not okay with that. So that's why I'm here tonight and then I share with my patients. I also get out in the community and talk about what people can do to um, implement studies that are going to help them be, be more healthy and vital throughout their whole life. Okay. Now, you guys all know who I am because I just introduced myself, but we don't know who you are. So, so you guys three know who you are here because you're you're married and friends. But I want everyone to introduce themselves and just let us know how you know about us, and that way we'll feel like we're a little bit more of a group. So let's start over here and just tell us how you heard about our office. Somebody I've known for years and years. Hi. Yes, good guy. My name is Gail, and I heard it through Sue. Good. All right. And I'm Sue Parker Wells, right. and I actually heard about you on uh, Amazon uh, Local or whatever. Like it's like some kind of special deal we had, right? Yes, a special deal okay. I, I had, and at that time I was really struggling with a very bad hip that I mm -hmm. couldn't seem to get better. Right. And just the way you're. Your, your website was and the way you described it, I thought, well, maybe this would be a, mm -hmm. a, an entryway to try and... Absolutely. And, and so... And has it worked out so far? It's worked out so far, so good. Very good. Glad to hear that. Yeah. Okay. And then over here? And I'm Daryl Wells. I'm uh, Susan's husband, and uh, that's how I heard about it. And I'm always looking to be younger. So All right. Well, you've come to the right place. Yeah. Very good. Okay. All right. So let's, let's kind of let's get started here. Now... I call this a workshop rather than a lecture, so I'll be asking you questions, and you are f feel free to ask any questions so we have a good exchange of information back and forth. So let's talk about where healthcare is in our country right now. How many of you have heard of the World Health Organization? Okay, it's the United Nations organization that kind of deals with like health issues on a, on a global basis. Well, a few years ago, they did some studies that came up with some really interesting results. What they did is they looked at the healthcare systems of all the industrialized nations. And what they, what they discovered is that you know, the United States of America had the number one crisis-based system in the world. Now, what I mean by that is that we had the best trained medical doctors who were great at helping people overcome traumas and keeping people alive and things like that. Now, they also, what they also found out was is that despite that system that we had, we spent a lot of money on, when we looked at the average American and said, let's compare it to other countries who have less medical doctors per, per capita and don't have um, access to like high-tech medicine, we actually scored worse than these countries did who have less access to medical care, which is kind of like, whoa, that seems kind of like a quandary. Why would that be? So what the study showed is that, that 77 countries actually have healthier people than we do, but yet they spend much less on medical care than the United States of America does. All right. In fact, here's what the study said. It says that in the United States we are paying more 
poor health care and we're actually living shorter lives as a result of that. They said basically you die earlier and spend more time disabled if you're an American rather than members of most other advanced countries. So again, 76 countries spent less, but they have had healthier people. I think that's a problem, don't you think? You're a business guy, right? Mm -hmm. With a company spending a lot of money on their business, but yet other co companies are doing better than they are and spending less. You got to look at that, right? Mm -hmm. and that, and the, um, our whole system is going through this huge changes. We're trying to sort some of this stuff out. Now, in the United States of America, over $2 trillion is spent on medical care. And that's actually kind of an old statistic. It's much more than that. We're only 3% of the world's population, but yet we consume 60% of all the manufactured drugs. So you think all this access to drugs, we would have, to have the healthiest people because we have all these medications that you can take for this and that ailment. But when you really look at it, unfortunately, the exact opposite is true. People that you know are on a lot of medications, are they healthier than people that are not on medications? They're in worse shape. And lots of times what I see in my practice is that a person goes on one medication, they have to get another one and another one and another one. So it's a, and fortunately it's kind of a downward spiral for a lot of people. Now in our, in our country, there's basically th three things that will kill the more majority of people. Now by a show of hands, what do you think one of those would, might be? And Susan, we just talked about one this morning, didn't we? One thing that kills a lot of people. Remember that? Oh, well, let's see, what was it? I read about, um, it was was a heart disease? Yeah. Yeah, the one, That's yeah. That's a good guess. There's three things, and that's a very good guess. Anybody yeah. have, an, Mary Ann, do you have an idea of what it else it could be? Cancer. Okay, that's a good guess, too. How about a third one? Um, disease. Diabetes. It's not bad. It's not bad. Let's talk about it. You, you, you got two out of three. So the first one is heart attacks. You told about these people that you knew that were like, seemed like they were fine and they just like, they dropped. Yeah. 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 Gail's husband. Yeah. And, and the other doctor here, Dr. Krause, he know he has a friend that he grew up with and he was, he's like in his mid forties and was just playing softball and just, just went down. So the interesting thing about it is that 50% of people who have a heart attack or 40% will actually don't will have Warnings. Sometimes the body will give us warnings, but sometimes there are no warnings. Heart failure is one of the fastest growing, growing syndromes or diseases in, in our country. We'll talk about what about some, some factors that play into that. Okay, second cause of death, Marion, very good. You got cancer. Now, one in three people will die from cancer. Forty years ago, one in thirty people died from cancer. So we are able to detect cancer earlier now, and we are able to help people survive from it, but actually more people are getting it. So, and that's despite all the research, over 60 billion a year is spent in the annual for the treatment and research to cure cancer. Now, mostly it's designed to treat cancer, but not as much research to find out what's causing it, okay? Because, you know, treatment of cancer, there's a lot of revenue there, isn't there? So, if we have a system that no matter how much money we throw at it, we still aren't producing a healthy country or a healthy citizen in our country. So, no matter how much money we throw at it, it's not getting very good results. So, if this is happening, would it make sense that we might need to look for some alternatives? Does it make sense? That doesn't mean we have to throw medical care totally out the window, but I think it makes sense that we've got to look for some more effective ways that are lower tech and less costly to get people to Get be healthy and stay that way. This is this is this is what's driving this, these changes in healthcare. It's going to have to happen. It's just, there's just no way around it. Now, number three cause of death. Now, this might be shocking to you, or it might not be. The number three cause of death in a country is actually medical care. Mm, yeah, it's actually medical shocking. care. Because medical care is invasive, isn't it? And there's side effects and things like that. Now, again, this isn't me saying this. The Journal of the American Medical Association said. At least 198,000 people die each year from adverse drug reactions. Now, they didn't take the drugs wrong. They were prescribed the medications and it caused, caused death. At least 145,000 people die each year from unnecessary surgeries. They didn't need the surgery and there was complications and they died. Here, here's what a study about Medicare. This is what Medicare alone says. Preventable, preventable medical mistakes are so common in U.S. hospitals that over the year 2006 to 2008, there were nearly one million instances among Medicare patients, and one in ten of them was deadly. Twenty-eight percent of all hospital visits are from adverse drug reactions. 
Now, John Hopkins Medical School refined this research and, dis and discovered that medical errors plus prescription drugs may actually be the leading cause of death in our country. Not good news. Who knows who this guy is? Einstein. Was he pretty smart, Marianne? He was smarter than me, I'll, I'll totally admit That's that. So. He was smarter. <laughs> He's probably smarter than most of us here. Now, here's what he said. He's the guy that came up with that definition that said that, that if you do the same thing over and over again, but yet you expect a different result, he said that was the definition of insanity. It wasn't necessarily the medical definition of insanity, but that's, that's what he said. It. In his mind, that's what that meant. So all these people dying is like the equivalent of three 747s crashing every day and killing everybody on board. Now, we all remember 9-11, right? That was, a, that was a terrible day in, our, in the history of our country. And all those people died on the same day, and it just was like it dominated the news for months. But it's like actually having 9-11 happen every day because it's a person here, a person there. It doesn't make the front page. But if you actually look at the paper, there's this evidence of this thing that you, know, you will see now on a weekly basis. Now, if the airline industry was so dangerous that a 747 would crash every, every other day and everybody died, would you be like really excited about booking your next flight? You'd be like, Amtrak or Greyhound bus or some, some other alternative, right? Now here's, so based on that, then why would a person use medical doctors for health care? Now that sounds like a really provocative statement. Here's what I mean by this. Medical care is great for crisis intervention. They do a great job keeping people alive, surgeries, you know, helping people when they have cancer, helping them fight cancer. Um, people need surgeries and life-saving antibiotics. It's all very important. And when you have those issues, you definitely need to um, avail yourself of that kind of care. But it's very, very poor for helping people overcome chronic ailments and also preventing the problem in the first place. It's always after the fact. So there are doctors that deal with your health on a more, um, more wellness basis, chiropractors, naturopaths, acupuncturists. We all look to help the body heal itself, remove the interference that's keeping the body from healing itself. right? Now, for instance, with your, with your low back issue, we didn't give you any medica medications, right? We didn't take any body parts out either. What we did is we just removed the blockages that were keeping your body from working properly. Just helped your own body's ability to heal itself work better. And that's what we did. So let's not die from these three diseases. Deal? Okay. Okay. All right, good. So tonight is an opportunity for change. When you change your health, it transforms your life. And a little bit later, we're gonna, I'm going to share some amazing testimonies of people who have been under, in our care, and it will show you how, how much it's transformed their lives. Now, there is a power that made the body. That power also heals the body. We know that when male and female components get together, there's something amazing that happens. It's called life. People are, are born, they live their lives, and eventually they're going to die. And based, depending on whatever your spiritual beliefs are, um, that life force is going to go somewhere else and the body will kind of return to the ground, so to speak. Now, if you were to take a uh, dead body and try to measure the amount of energy, how much energy would be there? What do you think? And your name is Joyce. Gail. Gail. Okay, Gail. How much energy would be there, Gail? I have no idea. Okay. Just, do you have any... any a dead body? Had, yeah, if you had to guess. Multiple choice. You're already taking a test. A dead body, a, a living body would have a lot of energy, right? Yeah, a dead body would have none. A dead body would have a, not very much. It, could, it might not be zero, but it would be fairly close to zero, right? And on that dead body, you could like hook them up to the electrodes like they do like on, uh, you know, on some of those medical shows where they like give them resuscitation or they like electrocute them and they like, they jump up. And if, if, the, if the person's dead, it's not going to do anything. You could do emergency surgery, you could give them vitamins, you could do an adjustment on a dead person. Nothing's going to happen. And the reason being is because that life force isn't there anymore. Okay. Now, that life force in the body is in the form of electricity. Your body actually generates electricity. And you probably realize this when you like, um, you have maybe some shoes that build up static electricity and you touch something that's metal, you touch something you didn't, didn't mean to do, then all of a sudden you get a shock. Because body travels through, electricity travels through the body. So one of the first principles of optimal health is to get more of this life energy, whatever you want to call it, electricity, through the body, moving in the body. So to get health, there's three things that you need. You need a properly functioning brain and nervous system, because that brain and nervous system runs the whole show. 
You need to have balanced metabolism. That's your body chemistry, the chemical reactions in your body. And also your mental health and having a positive attitude. That's very important too. Now the energy and light moves through the body. It, it probably maybe starts in the brain if there is a starting point for it. Now here's the interesting thing. One cubic inch of your brain, if you unravel the neurons and were able to string them all together, it would actually go from here to Boston and back couple times. 10,000 miles of tissue unraveled, that's very small, but it was unraveled, that's how far it would go in one cubic inch of your brain. Isn't that amazing? We're all smarter than we give ourselves credit for, right? Now the energy's got to travel very quickly in the body. It's about 270 miles an hour because you've got to react to life. The brain needs fuel and activation in order to function. That fuels going to be oxygen that you breathe and the glucose that you metabolize as you digest your food. And it also needs stimulation, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So the nervous system is composed of the brain, spinal cord, and the nerves. And the, that information flows like a river down the spinal cord, out between the bones of the spine, to the nerves and to the organs. Every soul is totally dependent on that energy to stay alive. Now it's back up here. Whoops. Now, according to Gray's Anatomy, that's not the show, that's the book. Okay? <laughs> the nervous system controls and coordinates all the systems of the body and coordinates that individual so it can adapt to his or her environment. Now, you gotta make, in this pathway from the brain through the spinal cord and the nerves, we've got to have no kinks in the hose. So any interference to the neurons in the brain level or the spinal cord level or in the peripheral nerves is going to cause interruption in communication and ultimately poor health. So we've got to have this, so the spine supports and, and um, protects that, that spinal cord and we need to have a balanced spine in order to have no kinks or interference along that pathway. So we should have balanced posture. So just like if there's pressure on a hose, it's going to affect the water flow, right? So if there's pressure on nerves, it's going to affect health. There are nine systems in the body, but only one is encased in bone. Now, we believe that the body that was intelligently designed, why would it make sense, say Marianne, for the for the body to have the nervous system totally encased in bone. Or do you think that would make sense? To protect it. Protect it. It's so delicate. In fact, who's heard of who heard about what happened to Christopher Reeve? First rank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he broke his neck, right? Mm -hmm. And he got become paralyzed from he couldn't use his arms, couldn't use his legs. Mm -hmm. But even breathe, his bowels didn't even work because he had damage to his spinal cord and interrupted the communication of the brain trying to tell the body what to do. Now, people like you and me, we don't have nerve compression to that degree, but it's been studied in, in the laboratory that the weight of a quarter will actually decrease the nerve function by 60%. So if a person's only getting 40% um, function in their body, that person's going to be very debilitated in many, many levels of, of their health and well-being. Now the weight of a dime, of course that weighs less than a quarter, that would also cut off life energy by 40%, uh, so you'd only be getting 60%. If you have that pressure on the nerves, your body's weakening and you're going to be susceptible to disease and disability. Now, these, this, these misalignments that we talked about, they're called subluxations. It's kind of a funny word, but it's easy to remember because a dislocation, everyone knows what that is. Well, subluxation, sub meaning less, so it's a partial dislocation gets in the way of the brain communicating with the body. Now what causes these things? You know, people when they see their x-rays and they come and they always want to know, how did my spine get like that? So there's basically three, th three things that can interfere with that. Emotional stress, okay? No one here ever has that, right? No one ever has emotional stress, just me, I guess, huh? <laughs> okay, so being married or being in a relationship, raising kids, having financial challenges, um, having um, taking care of ill family members, have a stressful job, that that tension and irritation can cause your body to go into kind of a reaction, and then because the muscles attached to the bones, that can pull the bones of the spine out of position, 
Also, a lot of times people don't realize that chemical stress also affects the nerves. Have you ever heard of a condition called peripheral neuropathy, where people can't feel their feet or hands, and they get burning and pain, it's a very painful condition? And one of the reasons that they get that is they have diabetes, or they have pre-diabetes, and when the blood sugar gets too high, it's toxic to your nerves, and you can lose feeling in your, in your extremities. So chemical stress can affect nerves as long as physical stress. Now, um, physical stresses would be like, um, you know, you don't, you're not very active, and all of a sudden you go like run a marathon, or you like, you know, play four rounds of golf on the week when you don't usually do that. That might be a little bit more than your body can handle. That might upset the joints and the nerves. The DMV says that about every 10 years, the average person's going to be in a car accident. So you've got this massive force running into your car, that force is moving through your body, out through the front of your car. You see a lot of those kind of patients and it really can, can cause a devastating effects to people's health and then the nerves get damaged. Now there's one other cause that we haven't talked about that you never ever think about, but it's, it's there every day. And it affects everyone on the planet exactly the same. Does anybody have an idea what that, that force is? Gravity. Gravity, good job, Lindsay. <laughs> Very good, Lindsay. Yeah, gravity. You don't think about gravity. You know, when the astronauts go up into space and they come back like an inch and a half taller, just because the gravity is not always pushing down on us. So we have we have a spinal curvature in our body that is basically the best way for us to fight against gravity. We should have a backwards curve in our neck, a forwards curve in our mid back, and a backwards curve in our low back. So that S-shaped curve gives us the best way for the muscles to pull on those bones to hold us up against gravity. So when we, our posture changes and we lose alignment, it's going to take a lot more energy to hold that body up than it should be. And it's going to take away energy from like your, your vitality, your overall energy level. It can take energy away from your digestion and your metabolism. Now here's a cool story. I just found this out today. One of my patients, she came in, she's having like back and neck pain. Also her energy level was low. She also liked to lose some weight. And the only thing she's been doing for the last two weeks is get chiropractic care and she's lost 10 pounds and done nothing else. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Well, this doesn't happen in every patient, but I've had it happen before. And because the chiropractic adjustment affects your metabolism, her metabolism is working better because we're getting more energy, more nerve flow to her body. And she's lost 10 pounds, hasn't changed one thing. That's cool, isn't it? That's very cool. So that really shows that Nerves, nerves aren't just for muscles, Ner nerves are for organs. To have healthy organs, we've got to have body chemistry working properly, we've got to have brain and the nerves working properly. All right, so gravity. Now your body's, always, is your body's ability to be healthy is dependent upon your ability to repair. So let's say that your, your stressor is this, but your repair is this, you kind of maintain where you're at. But what happens if your stress goes like this? then you're not repairing and what you're, you're into a downward spiral. Now what we want to do with our patients is remove the interference that's keeping them from being healthy and then keep it that way so even if their stress goes up we can do things to kind of keep matching it so they can adapt better. I, I'm, I amazingly have amazing results with people who have mental health. I have people who have mental health problems when they come to see me. They don't usually come for that reason but with what we do with the brain work, which you'll learn about in a little bit, and also working with the spine, and also working with the body chemistry. I have a, I just posted two videos on Facebook. Lindsay's our Facebook poster. We just posted two videos on Facebook of people who had depression, anxiety, and just doing fantastic. No medications whatsoever. Just getting their physiology working better, getting their brains working, and they're doing great. And this is something that I've seen over and over again with what we do. It's, it's great. All right. Now, these misalignments or subluxations, they affect the body on two levels. They get in the way of the energy from the brain to the organs and also weaken the overall spinal structure. And what it's going to do is going to change your posture. So you say, well, how would I know if a person has a spinal problem? Well, you could ask them if they have health condition. That would be one thing that you can do. But also what you can do is you can look at a person's posture because a posture is the window to the spine. Okay. So if a person has postural distortions, then they have to have a misalignment. So what we're going to do is we're going to have some little fun here. We're going to do this exercise. We're going to like help you understand how important posture is to your health. Before I do that, what I want to do is I just want to share a couple of really interesting 
studies that occurred in some pretty prestigious medical journals. Now, here's what this journal said about posture and overall health. It said deviations in the body center of gravity cause poor posture, which result in intestinal problems, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, osteoporosis, hip and foot deformities, poor health, decreased quality of life, and a shorter lifespan. And they've actually known this since 1957, so it's not like brand new information. Now, Spine 2005 says all measures of health status show significantly poor scores as the C7 plumb line deviations increased. So here's the C7 plumb line. The top of your ear should line up with the middle of your shoulder, and the middle of your shoulder should line up with the middle of your hip. The middle of your hip should line up with the middle of your ankle. So if you're this, your health is not as good as that if you line up. Everything else being equal, it's just not as good. This has been this has been shown. Now something else. This is this is from Geriatric Society 2004. It said older men and women with hyperkyphotic postures have a higher mortality rate. What they're just saying is people die sooner. People who especially have this. You sometimes see people who have that kind of bent bent forward posture. Those people die sooner than those that don't. The Journal of Pain Management 1984 says spinal pain, headache, mood, blood pressure, pulse, and lung capacity are among the functions most easily influenced by the posture. Archives of Internal Medicine, 2007, said loss of height linked to heart disease and early death. Height loss was associated with a 42% increased risk of coronary events such as heart attacks, even in men and women who had no history of cardiovascular disease. Okay, now let's have everybody stand up. Let's do this. This is a fun exercise that we're going to enjoy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to analyze everybody's posture. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you into kind of a, a little bit of an exaggerated posture of what you have typically going on. Okay? So Marianne, we're going to look at you first. Okay, you know, okay. low shoulder position. We're just going to tilt you like this, and we're going to roll your shoulders forward like that. Okay. Okay. Here we go. All right. And you're pretty level here, but we do have a little bit of this going on. So we're just going to kind of roll those shoulders forward. We're going to, we're going to decrease your curve a little bit there. Good. Thank you. We're going to do this too. We're actually going to do this because that's your distortion. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do is we're going to do this, and we're going to roll this forward a little bit. Here. We're pretty balanced in our shoulders, but we're going to do this a little bit. Okay? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to take a deep breath in and just kind of feel what it feels like to get that oxygenation in your body. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to do a corrective posture. So, we're going to balance your shoulders. We're going to bend your head back, which puts a better curve. Back like this. Back like this. Good. And for you, we're going to balance that out back like this. We're just going to put a better curve. We're going to put a little bit better curve there. Good. So whatever what you going to do for you, just the back like this, and just put your shoulder back. Now take a deep breath in. What'd you notice? Girl. Totally different, huh? This here. Totally different. So when people have postural distortions, they're not getting the oxygen that they can actually are intended to get. Okay? So when people don't get enough water, we call that dehydration. Okay? But when people don't get enough air, that's suffocation. When people don't have enough nerve supply, then we call that a subluxation. Okay? Have a seat. Did everybody kind of feel how dramatic that was? Oh, yeah. It's dramatic, isn't it? Yeah. Now, here's one of the things. People see me for all kinds of different reasons, but what's interesting is that a lot of people will say, even though they can come in for low energy, say, my energy level is better. And, you know, we didn't give them speed or anything like that. You know, we just basically helped get the blockages out that help their body work to the capacity that it was intended to. Now the nervous system is kind of like an upside down apple tree. So we've got, so an apple tree is going to grow because of a root system. And that root system is going to take energy up through the tree trunk. And it's going to send that energy out along the uh, branches. And it's going to eventually give nourishment to that fruit so that fruit can bear, that tree can bear a lot of fruit. Now, if we, have a, if we have a blockage, let's say if the root system becomes like, you know, let me say there's some kind of, um, you know, root rot or something, or some kind of fungal problem where that, those root systems don't get the nutrients, or if there's some kind of issue where the, where the trunk of the tree has been damaged in some way, eventually, what's, how vital is that fruit going to be, do you think, if we've got interference anywhere along that pathway? How would it resist disease compared to if there was no, nothing getting in the way? Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's not going to resist it as well. So the same analogy as the body. This is like the brain here, your spinal cord, the nerves, and these are the organs. 
Now, when you have these subluxations, 90% of the time there is no pain. Now, a lot of my patients go, well, if I have a nerve that's pinched, wouldn't it always be painful? Absolutely, the answer is absolutely not. The reason is that your nerves do about three main things. They sense things, okay, so that would be a pain or a lack of sensation. Muscles also control motor activity, like movement, right? But also one thing that nerves, people don't realize what nerves do is nerves also take nutrition to the cells. The blood system does that, but the nerves do that too. Now, did you ever remember, do you, do you remember in your memory the before and after picture of Christopher Reeve? Superman, right? Great posture, very well developed guy. Then several years after his, his um, paralysis, how did he look compared, comparatively? He was totally shriveled up. He's like, he looked like a California raisin is what he looked like. And the reason being is that he was getting such poor nerve supply to his body, his body, his organs were atrophying. And the interesting thing that he died of, he did not, he did not die directly of the paralysis. What he did is a side effect of it. What he did is he got a virus. He got a cold, basically. Like, we get and we fight it off and we get better. Well, he didn't get better. And his heart failed because his body could not fight off a virus. He died. And he was a great guy, and he was very um, influential and very um, inspirational to people who had that, that paralysis. But eventually, eventually he did die, unfortunately. Now, so 90% of the time, just like heart disease or cancer, you don't feel it in the beginning. In fact, here, 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 this is an amazing story that I'll share with you. I had a patient who came to me. She came for weight loss, and she had some uh, sleep apnea. She had some back pain, and also she had chronic sinus issues. Within a week of care, she didn't have any sinus issues. She started losing weight, and we had it on our weight loss program. And I did some tests on her, and we found that one of her hormones was kind of way out of whack. And so what I did is I said, you know, go get this checked out. And she got checked out, and she had a CAT scan, and she had cancer. But we were able to catch it before anything happened. It had metastasized, and she just had surgery last week. And it was, she told me, she emailed me, said, stage three cancer. So that's a that's a really good um, a really good lesson to all of us is that you can have cancer and not feel it, right? All right. So by the time you are in pain, it means that the nerve system is so inflamed that your body is in a crisis. So here's what's really going on, but here's what you're feeling up here. Remember the Titanic? Did, did this part up here sink the Titanic? No, they actually missed that when they turned the boat. They thought they dodged the bullet, but because they didn't know about this. It scraped the bottom of the boat, and they went down, what, like two hours, two and a half hours, they went down to the bottom of the Atlantic. Now, the first subluxation can actually occur at birth. Marianne, can you see how that might be possible? Sure. Yeah. And as, as an adult, you have muscle tone that you can resist this. And, but as, a, but as an infant, you don't have any muscle tone. And uh, Lindsay, can I tell your story? Lindsay's, Lindsay's my stepdaughter, so um, I've been her stepfather for like uh, a long time now, right? 20 years. 20 years, something like that. Lindsay, before I married her mom, was a forceps delivery. And when she, she did not breathe through her nose for like the first couple of, no, she did not sleep through the night for the first three years that her mom was taking care of her. Can you imagine that? It's bad enough or it goes for like six weeks, right? Three years. Never slept for the night. She had a very weak immune system. Got sick all the time. When she would have a birthday party, Lindsay would get sick. We'd have to cancel it because she couldn't handle stress. Even excitement she couldn't handle. She was allergic to all the, the animals in the house and um, also the Christmas tree. And I like met, grass and, you know, all these yeah, all kinds anything. of anything. She was just uh, kind of a frail... Frail girl. That was a hot mess. Yeah, she was. She started getting chiropractic care. There's some nutritional things that we did with her. And within maybe about a year or so, she did better. So the breathe through her nose much better. Wasn't reacting to the um, allergens that she was having trouble with. And In fact, I don't have allergies at all now. Yeah, she has no allergies at all. And she's the beautiful 27-year-old uh, girl, right? 29. 29, days. okay. <laughs> I was close, 29. <laughs> so, you know, amazing story. So this can happen at birth. Especially if there's trauma involved, like suction or forceps, this can happen. And what you don't realize is that when you're in the womb, you have one curvature in your, in your spine. That's the fetal position. You have to go from th one curve to three curves by the time you can walk. 
That's a lot of change. So what happens if you get dropped on your head, or you don't come out and they yank you out, or if you have falls? That process of the spine growing properly can, can be a detriment to your health. <laughs> so, you know, amazing story. So this can happen at birth, especially if there's trauma involved, like suction or forceps, this can happen. And what you don't realize is that when you're in the womb, you have one curvature. In your, in your spine. That's the fetal position. You have to go from th one curve to three curves by the time you can walk. That's a lot of change. So what happens if you get dropped on your head or you, you don't come out and they yank you out or if you have falls? That process of the spine growing properly can, can be a detriment to your health. Now, some of the things that we do to rehab the spine is we do something called cervical traction, which we have right over here. And there's devices that help stretch out the tissues. It helps get motion, helps get energy and vitality in the spine. It actually feels really good. It takes about five minutes to do it. Also, the wobble chair is a rehab for the low back. What it does is it gets fluid in motion to the low back. It also helps strengthen all the core, so you have a strong core to help support your low back. So in our office, we do chiropractic adjustments and spinal rehab. The Pedibon weighting system is something that we use to actually help balance the posture. Now, here's what's interesting. Your body has what's called a writing reflex. So the writing reflex is like, if I stand you up and I push you this way, your nervous system says, well, I'm not going to fall over, so I'm going to push back. We can use that phenomenon to actually correct your posture. So if your head's out like, hit, like a lot of people have forward head postures. So, so if we put a small weight here, one or two pounds, if the muscle is strong enough, the writing reflex will actually cause those muscles to increase their tone, and it will actually help pull the head over the, over the center of gravity and improve the curve. We can also do that with a low shoulder. So that's one of the rehab things that we do. Now, here's an actual picture to show what's happening here. So here, we should have a nice arcing curve. You see how straight it is right here? It's like straight in its curve here. And then we have this forward po head posture right here. And so here's the same picture with the head weight there. We can see that we got a better curve and reduce the forward head posture. So if the muscles are strong enough, that'll happen. And that's a rehab thing that people, once we do, do the, um, the proper evaluation, they start doing it at home. Now, so we talked about the importance of the spine. Now let's talk about brain. Now here's the thing, some of my patients who see me not only have spinal subluxation, but their problems are actually higher in the brain. I have a patient who just started care this week and she has traumatic brain injury. And as a result of being rear-ended and having a concussion, she's unable to work. She can't, like if she, to do a recipe where you have to do eight, nine steps in a row, can't do it when I, when I give her commands like, you take your finger and touch the, your finger to tip your nose. She has to repeat it to herself to be able to do it. So she's got a, there's some serious things going on with her. And here's what's interesting about the brain is that everyone knows the brain controls the body. But when you had your last physical, how many doctors checked your brain? Nobody did. No one does it. But it's the most important organ in your whole body. Now the brain and the neurons are constantly under attack from inflammatory responses, immune reactions, blood sugar problems, deficiency of critical nutrients, and lack of stimulation. Now there is no specialty within traditional medical system, including medical neurology, that is trained to identify early signs of brain deterioration. If you have a tumor or something severed, then they can check you out. But what if your brain is just not up to par? There's no, they aren't trained to do that. Now, in chiropractic, there's a specialty called chiropractic neurology, which is where I'm trained in. It gives me additional training to basically look at and do testing on different areas of the brain so we can get the brain and rehab it and help it work better. And that's what I'm able to do with this patient who started care. When I did my evaluation on her, she would, she, when I had her close her eyes and said, okay, touch the, this finger to the tip of your nose, she went like this, like this, and like that. So her brain doesn't know where her arm is in space in relation to her head. After I did some therapies on her, I got her to the point where she was much closer, and we did that in about 20 minutes of care. So I know that I'll be able to help her, and it's going to change her whole life. Now, problems can occur when there's too much or not enough stimulus to the brain. This altered physiology is going to create unwanted symptoms. So the brain communicates with the glands through nerves and chemical signals. You've probably heard of like dopamine or GABA, serotonin. These are neurotransmitters. Now, the brain has four lobes to it. This is, back, this is your cerebellum back here. 
Your cerebellum controls balance and coordinated movement. And it's, a, it's the part that actually needs more oxygen than your heart. Back here is the occipital lobe. This is the parietal lobe here, which is sensation. Your frontal lobe up here is your personality, motor, motor function. Your brain stem is down in this area here. This is your cranial nerve function, organ function, and the respiration. Now, here's some fun facts about the brain. The female brain is more developed than the male brain. What are we going to say? This is how it is, Daryl. What can we do? See, I told you. Yeah, you told me. Right? Yeah, you told us, right? Okay, so part of the brain called the anterior cingulate is more developed than females, and that's be that tends to make you more comparing and compassionate. The angulate gyrus in the male brain is more developed, allowing for more mechanical aptitude. On, on general, men tend to do better with mechanical things. So it's a, it's a hardwired thing. The left brain is your analytical side. This, this lady that I talked to about, about the traumatic brain injury, she can't do math. It's a really terrible time with math. Couldn't add up a checkbook or couldn't add up a row of numbers. Detailed facts, computer p people who are usually um, good at computers or usually have strong left brain activity. Right brain is nonverbal communication. You ever had somebody mad at you but never said anything to you, but you know they're mad? They never said they're mad, but they're like, they look at you and you kind of, that's, that, that's nonverbal communication. You can tell that's a right brain activity. Um, humor, drawing, and reading comprehension. These are, tends to be the more of the creative part of the brain. People who are artists and things like that are very creative, tend to have strong right brain um, activity. Now, here's what typically happens. This is very simple, but here's what typically happens is that people tend to get in trouble with their cerebellum. The cerebellum seems to be really susceptible to um, trouble with your changes in your body chemistry or injury. I think this is what happened to this gal. Your cerebellum, when it stimulates, it stimulates your opposite cortex. And that opposite cortex is going to stimulate the, your brain stem. In your brain stem, you have a lower brain stem and an upper brain stem. So typically what happens is this was, here's what goes on. The cerebellum is going to stimulate the different hemispheres of the brain. And what that's going to do is that's going to fire into the lower brain stem. Now, if there's a, 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 a hiccup in that right cerebellum or the opposite cortex firing, what happens is that this midbrain has nothing to hold it back. How many people have been horseback riding in their life? You're going to horseback riding, and usually when you go horseback riding, you, unless you own your own horse, you rent a horse. And typically, in my experience, I've, I've probably done it five or six times, the horses usually don't want to go, they're not very motivated to go on the trek, but as soon as they turn around, they can't wait to get back because they're going to get fed. Stimulus response, right? So, when that lower brain stem doesn't stimulate the upper brain stem, it's like horses that you've lost the reins to. Like on, on the reins, you can pull back the horse and make it go slower. It's as if you've lost the reins and that midbrain over, over, it basically has nothing to hold it back. And as a result, all kinds of bad symptoms happen. So what happens is, is that when you get this overfiring of the midbrain, it stimulates, it, over, it creates what we call a oversympathetic activity in your nervous system. Like sympathetic activity is like fight or flight. So imagine that your body's in fight or flight all the time. So what happens is that you can become sensitive to light. It can actually interfere with your sleep. I've, I've helped people who have chronic sleep problems by just doing stuff to the brain to get the brain balance. Your brain inside this has this little um, clock that says when you should be awake and when you should be asleep. It also can make your heart race. It can also affect your digestive system. It can also dilate your blood vessels in your brain, which can cause migraines. It can also set you up for chronic pain. I see a lot of fibromyalgia patients, and these are patients who have pain over their whole body. And they get pain over their whole body because that sympathetic nervous system is basically pushing the fight or flight mechanism, and it will, as a result, the adrenal gland overstimulates some chemicals, and what it will do is it will stimulate all of the pain fibers in your body, and that's why they get the whole body pain. That's what causes fibromyalgia, at least on one level. Now, how, how do these things occur? How does my brain go bad? Well, it goes bad because of chemical problems. It also goes bad because of physical issues and also emotional stress. So chemical issues, um, we, how we measure them is we do blood testing and saliva testing to look at what's going on chemically. We also do physical tests, like a neurological exam, a spinal exam. And also, there might be emotional components to why people have challenges. So 
If our brain isn't firing, then our health isn't good. All right, some other areas of the brain when they don't work well, what it causes. It causes loss of short or long-term memory. We talked about peripheral neuropathy, and also people who have like ADD, ADHD, that's typically a left brain is ADD and right brain is ADHD. Now, just like how the spine can be rehabbed, the brain can also be rehabbed. Your brain has a, a capacity called plasticity. Just like a shoulder or knee can be rehabbed, the brain can be rehabilitated, which is great. So that lady who has a traumatic brain injury, with a proper rehab, she's going to gain more function. Her balance is already doing better, and I've only seen it like a couple times. Now, here's a kind of a cool video. Here's what, when we do stimulation to a neuron, here's what, how one neuron helps another neuron work better. I'm going to just play this video here. So you see how those neurons are basically growing together? So one neuron is getting stimulated. What it's doing is it's basically growing and stimulating that other neuron. So now we have a communication where we didn't have before. So that's the principle of how brain rehab can help a person gain more neurological function. Okay, cool. All right, so neurological treatments consist of treating the cerebellum the brain, and the brain. So what we have to make the brain better is we have to improve the um, fuel capacity of the brain by making sure that we have a good supply of glucose, by proper digestion, and then we also do things to activate the brain. So some of the therapies that we use, vibration, auditory stimulation, chiropractic adjustment. Now, if someone said metabolism, Daryl, if someone says metabolism, what is that? Like, if, how would you define what metabolism is? You kind of know what it is, but like, how would you define it? Feeds the brain? Yeah. But the words, metabolism is, is you take something in your body, your body digests it, assimilates it, and makes something else out. That's metabolism. Okay. Taking food into digestion. Now, the nervous system will regulate that, but here's the thing. What if there is a lack of available nutrients to make new tissues? Like, say, you didn't work, your diet didn't have enough zinc in it or B vitamins, and zinc and B vitamins make hydrochloric acid. So if we have these deficiencies, what would that, what would that do to the overall health of the body? Is healthy. Yeah, exactly. Because you're not digesting your food, that's a big, big problem, isn't it? And a lot of people have that problem. You might also have a hidden infection in your body. Every time you ate, say, gluten or wheat, maybe you get an inflammatory reaction. That would also affect your metabolism and your, and your energy level. So to look at things on a metabolic basis, this is what we do. We do proper testing with blood, looking at like the thyroid, liver, kidneys, look for food allergies. We also do stool-based tests to look at your... Um, what's going on in your gut, and we also would look at your, your uh, adrenal function by looking at saliva. Now, a lot of these tests are typically done, and a lot of people come to me who have chronic health conditions are, are missed. But the doctors say, I can't find anything wrong with you, but we know you're having problems. So we dig a bit deeper if we find the problems. Now, here's a real important thing that I, this is a really important concept, is that there's two different values when it comes to lab tests. There's what they call the functional range, and there's called the disease range. When you guys watched that uh, weight loss video, I talked about that. So the disease range is based on everyone who went to the lab last year and it's averaged all together. So they're basically taking people who have cancer, maybe an oxygen, and they're averaging that in. They're trying to come up with some kind of average, so quote, quote unquote average. The trouble is there's a lot of people that they're feeding that data in who are not very well. So as a result of that, a lot of people who are kind of on the borders, they're not, they're not diseased yet, but they're on the borders and are having symptoms, they're missed. So we use what's called the functional range, which is based on the laboratory results of people who are very healthy. And so that's, that it's better. You don't want to be just, um, you, you don't want to be just healthy enough to not be diseased. You want to be at 100% function. So a lot of people, I see a lot of thyroid patients who come to me, they have fatigue, their hair is falling out, but they're quote unquote in the normal range so they don't do anything and they just keep suffering. So here's how this would play out in real life. Let's say a person had glucose problems. Now here's the traditional sick range, 65 to 125.
the result comes back as 82. So the medical test says, oh, you're okay. But the person says, yeah, when I get up in the morning, I don't want any food. You know, in between meals, I totally crash. I don't feel like my brain's working right. Um, that's like typical, like, um, hypoglycemia. But because it's not in the sick range, they don't do anything. So, but based on the optimal range, you go, you got low blood sugar, and we do things to help that person stabilize their low blood sugar. Same thing happens with thyroid and other, and other things that we measure. So, what we do to get patient better is we look at all the different factors that's contributing. We look at the spinal issues, we look at brain issues, we look at what's going on with the uh, metabolism, food allergies, blood sugar, hormones, gut issues, and we look at all these things. And we look at what's functioning, we look at the function of the body and what is not working properly. And we find the cause and we design a treatment plan to address what we find. Now some of the people come to me, it's mostly just a chiropractic thing or maybe there's some nutritional things that we need to do. But I have a lot of really sick people that come to me and we have to work on their brains, we gotta work on their nutrition, and we gotta also work with the spine. So covering up the symptoms is never the answer. Yes, people do need medications on a short-term basis, but at some point, the medication really isn't doing anything because as soon as you go off it, all the symptoms come back. You know it's just covering it up. And a lot of people just do that because they don't know what else to do. That's what's happening. So what we do is we combine these different approaches. And when we look at the spine, we look at the metabolism, we look at the, the, the brain, there's many, many things that we can do to help. We can help people with back issues. We can help people who have chronic pain, fatigue, can't sleep, digestive problems, autoimmune conditions, thyroid problems, people with dizziness, headaches, migraines, peripheral neuropathies, just to name a few. So I've got some handouts that I want to get to. I'm going to ask each of you to write some health goals that you have that you'd like to accomplish, say, in the next 12 months. There you go. I'll spend a couple minutes on this. I'll give you a pen. And maybe what you'd like to accomplish, say, in the next five years, and most of you guys are already retired, so if you're already retired, you don't have to worry about that one. So we'll just take a couple minutes to do that. All right. All right. So what I'm going to ask you to do, if you could just read one of your goals that you'd like to say, as far as your health goes in the next year, just share one, one thing, if you could, Daryl. More energy. More energy. I hear that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, be pain free in my lower back. Okay, good. Thank you. I said live with high energy. High energy. Awesome. Very good. Cool. Very good.